Let's now ask the question, Sarah, what is it about palmitoleic acid that you think is such an important biomarker? Because we wouldn't be having this discussion if you didn't think we should be paying attention to this. Yeah, I think it's a really important biomarker. And if, if, you, if you would um, allow me, let me point out one other thing here regarding the triglycerides, because clearly the low carbohydrate arm decreased more in the triglycerides, okay? Um, the low fat arm decreased too, which may come as a surprise to your listeners because we do associate low fat with an increase in triglycerides. Um, but I do wanna remind everyone that this was a calorie restricted. So this was around 1500 calories. So that drop in the low fat diet arm, although maybe not what we were expected, does make sense with the reduction in calories overall. Now, let's go back and talk more about your question, okay? I think palmitoleic acid, or again, that's that 16-1, um, is really not appreciated um, as the health predictor that it really is, okay? So let's go through, I'm gonna just jump ahead a little bit here. So palmitoleic, or we like to call it POA, is a product of something called sterile CoA desaturase. Um, and sterile CoA desaturase is going to um, determine um, what is going to happen with some of the fatty acids in our system, specifically what's going to happen to POA. Now what we know ahead is that sterile CoA desaturase is actually an independent marker of triglyceridemia and abdominal adiposity. So in other words, an independent marker of all those things that go along with insulin resistance, all right? So if we have a high levels of sterile CoA desaturase activity, you know, right there, we gotta start thinking, things may be concerning, even if someone has a normal blood sugar, right? Because right now, I think one of the important things based on our the earlier part of our conversation where we say so many times these things are missed, you know, people can still have normal blood sugars, you know, it's going to be really important, you know, number one, that we make everyone aware that a normal blood sugar doesn't mean that you are healthy. But number two, what are some easy ways and some easy markers maybe that we can check to know that we're headed for trouble even before we have blood sugar go up? Okay, so plasma um, uh, triglycerides, and let's take a look at, um, again, POA in those plasma triglycerides in the way of looking at it in quartiles, okay? So again, low versus high. And what we can see is the POA, all right, the byproduct, okay, of sterile CoA desaturase is much higher the higher the triglycerides are, okay? Very important. So if your triglycerides are really high, again, what's happening very likely is that your POA is elevated as well, okay? Brought about by increased activity of sterile CoA desaturase. And this shouldn't be surprising, right? Because no. if you look at the very, you know, unfriendly diagrams of fatty acid metabolism, um, one of the first steps we see in the conversion of, or elongation of fatty acids is the conversion of C16-0, palmitic acid, into C16-1, uh, palmitoleic acid, N7, through an enzyme that has two names, I guess, depending on the name nomenclature, right? So delta nine desaturase, desaturate the number nine carbon from the delta end, also known as sterile CoA uh, uh, saturase, uh, desaturase, which I think is the more popular name is, is SCD1, right? Right. And if, you, and if you go down that pathway, what you're basically doing is bundling and packaging fat to leave the liver, right? 
Yes. And, and, and here is one of the, that is an interesting point because the question is if we're trying to change the serum saturated fats into something else, okay? I mean, the body is obviously doing that. One would have to wonder, is that a protection mechanism? Why do we want to do that? I, I, yeah, I, to me, that's a great question, Sarah. It seems counterintuitive if I'm going to be obvious because we would think that a saturated fat is much safer. It's inert. There's no chance a reactive oxygen species can be formed out of it. I, why is it our body, even if we wanted to export fat from the liver, which we could argue all the reasons that's not a great idea, why would we go to the trouble of this conversion? All right, well, let's go through it really quick and then get to answering that question because I think it's really important and really sheds light on why we need to be paying more attention to the all-important POA and, of course, the um, precursors and, and um, enzymes that uh, act in its creation. So let's go through, if you will, this cartoon that I know looks really busy um, initially. Um, but let me just kind of run through it, starting here um, in the intestine. And remember, you know, we'll start off by saying our focus in healthcare um, and in nutrition recommendations for so long has been low fat, low fat, more carbohydrates, higher carbohydrates. Well, let's take a look in the intestine at those carbohydrates, changing the focus for a minute. So they come in rapidly absorbed carbohydrates or even our slowly absorbed carbohydrates, our starches, okay? Um, and what happens when they come in, right? As glucose, um, that feeds in again through GLUT2 into the pancreas, pushing out more insulin. Insulin then feeds into the liver. And what we get here, okay, is going through it a uh, big, big part of this is SREBP1, okay? And I don't know if we need to get that technical, but we'll lead here to that enzyme we were talking about, the SCD1 um, uh, or sterile CoA desaturase increasing, okay? Very important. And it comes about through other means as well. Fructose coming in through GLUT5 or glucose coming directly into the liver through GLUT2. They're all feeding into this by slightly di different mechanisms to increase this SCD1. Now we're gonna look more at the process um, in a different way. So we have increased hepatic, first of all, saturated fat. Okay, here's our 16 0 the saturated fat, all right, uh, increase hepatic levels of this. What gets turned on as from the past cartoon, we get that SCD1 activity increasing that leads to this increase in POA, all right? Coming down here, what's the end game here? increased VLDL, all right? Same thing over here, looking at it different. Um, we see again, SCD1, if it's blocked, we won't see that, all right? We'll see a decrease in VLDL. And this again has to do, if this SCD enzyme is blocked, we're going to have an increase in the saturate, a decrease in our POA, okay? But again, what we have when we're consuming the high carbohydrates, even if they're the, again, more refined carbohydrates or the less rapidly absorbed carbohydrates, this is the path that we wind up going on. 16-1 is our 16-0, Saturated fat is elevated and it turns on this cascade leading to increase in VLDL. I'll pause there before we 
go on if you had any comments that you wanted to add here. Yeah, again, I think, you know, for, for folks that are watching this, it's going to make a bit more sense. And if you're not, I just want to make sure we're, we're bringing you along for the ride. So, you know, in the liver, when you are taking C16 or C18, but let's just keep the discussion simple and start with a saturated C16, it's, it's the first committed step is going through SCD1 as an enzyme and it adds that double bond. It makes a few more steps along the way, but ultimately it is increasing a process of lipogenesis. It is making more lipid. It is increasing the amount of lipid within the cholesterol ester and the triglyceride. It is being exported from the liver. So in response to your question, Sarah, is this protective? I guess the answer looks like the body is saying, well, gosh, I would rather get this fat out of the liver than keep it in the liver. And we know that it's not fully successful in doing that because of course, although it hasn't come up yet on this discussion, everything we've talked about today runs hand in hand with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is truly an epidemic at the moment. Um, but I suspect that the body is still doing its best, even in the case of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, to try to export this fat as much as possible. The triglyceride is a very efficient place to store it. Um, I've always believed obesity is a protective mechanism. I think that obesity is not the cause of metabolic illness, but the result of it, um, which is not to say that the inflammatory environment that comes with it doesn't pour more gasoline on that fire. But I, you know, it is my belief um, that everything we're talking about here is the body's aim to protect itself from an abundance of nutrition. Um, and so I, that's how I read this is the body is doing, and specifically the liver, which is I, arguably the most important organ in this situation, the liver is really trying to protect us. And it's saying, I'm making so much extra fat right now because you as my individual are so far above your carbohydrate consumption tolerance, your, your tolerance for carbohydrate consumption. Um, and this is the most efficient thing I can do, which is turn that into fat, send it out via the VLDL, get that into the adipose site. And yeah, you're gonna be a little bit fatter and it's gonna come with some downstream problems, but in the short term, it's protecting me, the liver. Do you, would you agree with my teleologic view of that? I 100% would agree with it. And again, you know, it, it's, I, I think that we are going to have more and more details on this coming out very, very soon in many research product projects that are currently ongoing. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.